Well, good morning from the banks of Kanaka Creek and Maple Ridge. I'm Ross Davies. I work with uh, these guys. You can go on our website and peruse us to your heart's content. Today we're talking about fish and so many times, especially if you're new to this, you're looking at your creek, your stream, and what have we got here? What are we dealing with? Well, I thought today we'd just take a little run through the salmonid life cycle. Before we're out in the field, you know, either minnow trapping fry or just observing them, trying to determine what you have, you want to do some homework because there's plenty of resources, plenty of ID um, sheets, brochures, pamphlets you can look through or go on the internet and look at some images as well, right? So you do some preparation there. You want to ask yourself, what are we expecting to find in this creek? You might think back to, okay, last October, November, there was adult chum all over the place. So it stands to reason in April, or in this case, May, you're going to see chum fry. Or if we had coho in the system or chinook, same thing. As far as telling them apart goes, there's a few things to look for. If your fry are in big bunches, big schools, quite silvery, all traveling together, you're probably looking at chum. They've got very tiny little par marks on them, very small, they're quite silver. Coho tend to be solitary in small groups, sort of milling around, because it's a different habit. They're going to stay in fresh water for a full year. And the coho have a sort of, a, sort of an orange tail to them, you can see that. And a bit of a white stripe along the anal fin as well, and way more distinct par marks than the chum do. So coho and chum are the, the two main ones you're going to see on the BC South Coast. If you're dealing with the interior or even on the coast, more on that in a minute, you might run into Chinook. And Chinook out migrants go out at, at about three months old, which would put them about this big. And they just tend to be overall darker than the coho. They tend to be a little larger than the coho fry of the year and their par marks are thicker. And the mouth is a different shape as well. Of course, the only fry with no par marks at all, that's your pink salmon. You'll see those at the fry stage only. Them, along with the chum, only go out as fry. They'll, you'll never see them in fresh water at either anything other than this big or at the adult size when they return in three, four years. Okay, we're talking about some different characteristics you want to look for in your juvenile salmon or trout or whatever. So you can look at the fins, right? A coho will tend to have an orange tail or caudal fin, if you like. The coho will also tend to have that little white stripe on the anal fin right on the ventral side closest down to the tail. You can talk about par marks, and we're not talking golf course here. These are the vertical bars you're going to see on most salmon fry when they're young. And there they are right there. There's your coho, and I mentioned a little earlier about the difference between a coho and chinook. The difference in the par marks, chinooks are a lot thicker, closer together than the coho. The chums are very indistinct and they're up above the lateral line, up near the top. That's the same with sockeye. No par marks, bingo, you've got a pink salmon fry. So you're going you're gonna to want to know what's in your area, what's known to be there, what can you expect to find. That's a big help because so many times, right, you walk along a creek and you see, oh, there's a group of fry swimming around. We didn't get to see them up close. I wonder what they are. Well, we know this creek's got chum and coho. There was a whole bunch together, they look kind of silvery, their par marks look pretty small, so we're probably looking at a group of chum. But at the same time, to keep an open mind, expect the unexpected. I'm going to use an example right here on Kanaka. Starting about six years ago with our spring minnow trapping, we were catching coho, we were catching chum, juveniles, no surprise there. And then one day I looked and, well, that one looks a little different, and realized, you know what, guys, that's a Chinook. And it turns out these juvenile Harrison Chinook, and probably not just Harrison, other systems as well, come down the Fraser and make a right turn at Albuquerque and use these lower tributaries to feed and clean out their gills a little bit before resuming their journey out to the Pacific. So to always be open-minded for something you haven't seen before. Some salmon are colonizers. You take a creek, turn the water on, in a few hundred years you're going to have salmon in it. They do tend to stray a little bit. In general, in general, the cutthroat have a longer mouth. They have more spots on their body than rainbow tend to do. And they have the two orange slashes under the jaw. You know, that's usually a cutthroat, but I'll throw a curveball at you. As a kid walking a million creeks in Coquitlam area where I attempted to grow up, 
rainbow and cutthroat hybridize. They spawn together and they do that on purpose to confuse biologists. So quite oftentimes you won't be able to tell for sure unless you see a lot of them together. Once we get into the adult stage it gets a lot easier and we'll get to that a little later in the talk but cutthroat adults are fairly easy to tell from rainbow just the amount of spotting, the different size, the longer mouth and they have high oily teeth down in the throat that's so they can chow down on sticklebacks and other things that other trout can't. Now another thing I want to point out too as we go along is it's okay to not be a hundred percent sure. A case in point that I'll use our Creek Kanaka again as an example. We routinely see cutthroat trout, they're probably anadromous, schooling up in this area and they're either in here in the fall and winter looking for chum salmon eggs or as is the case now in the springtime they're looking for fry. So we can look off the bridge there down in the water and see schools of them or see them from over here under the bridge and even though we can't say for sure they're cutthroat, we can't get up close to them, we can only see them from a distance, we can say we see what we're pretty sure are cutthroat trout all schooled together. So it's okay to say we saw what appeared to be a school of chum fry, we didn't see them up close, but that's probably what they are. And that gets back to knowing your stream, knowing what's historically true for that water course and what to expect. Another thing with the juvenile salmonid ID is size matters, all right? Size does matter. If you see a fry or a fingerling, that's the term for a, a young salmon that's as long as your finger. If it's this big, it's not a chum, it's not a pink, that's for sure. And it's probably not a Chinook. It's most definitely going to be a coho. Of course, because they spend a year in fresh water, sometimes too, before heading to the ocean to get them the size they need, because they're about this big when they get out to, in the case of the Fraser, Vancouver Airport. So if you see a salmonid that's about this long in fresh water and it's got some par marks on it, and you're thinking, well, that's not a trout, doesn't have all the right spots, you're probably looking at a coho. So size is an important characteristic as well. Now, one of the things worth mentioning is, are you even looking at a salmonid? And that opens another can of worms. What's a salmonid? Well, that is your family of salmon trout. Your salmon, your trout, your char, which is your bull trout, your lake char, eastern brook char, and your whitefish as well. And what makes a salmonid has this. That's the adipose fin. It's midway between the dorsal and the tail. So you could look down again at your school of fish and ask yourself, well, are we even looking at salmonids? Because we've got other fish in here in the Saprinidae family. By that, I mean the minnow family. And that includes almost everything under the sun. Carp, dace, pike minnow, peamouth chub, which we have. So if you see a fish swimming around that's this big, this time of year, has no adipose fin, well, it's, it's a Saprinid. It's a, it's a chub of some kind, probably, because they're in here spawning right now. So make sure you're looking at salmonids. We also have three spine stickleback that are in the creek as well. And you'll see them, they're about this long and they're, they have this habit of using their pectoral fins for locomotion. So they're quite common and they're always gonna be about that big. Here we have a nice uh, rainbow trout here. And what makes this a trout? Well, if you really wanna get technical, if you've got fewer than 13 fin rays in this anal fin here, and those are the little like so in the fin. Fewer than 13 is a trout, 13 or more you're looking at a Pacific salmon. That's the main difference. Size wise, unless it's a steelhead, trout will tend to be smaller than adult salmon. Now the thing that's most likely to get this confused with is a coho jack. What's a jack? It's a coho male that decided to come home a year early. He got to be this size or this size and said, you know what, I'm going to come back and spawn with the big guys. So the coho male will look different than the trout. He'll have white gums, really distinct white. It's really easy to tell. Have a different shaped nose. The coho jack male will probably have a little bit of a kipe. That's a hook on the nose. Kind of goes like that. And there won't be as many spots on the tail. And while I'm quickly on the subject of coho, it drives me nuts. I see ID charts that say coho salmon have spots only in the upper half of the tail. Don't use that. I've seen spots on the upper half, the lower half, or both halves with coho. It's more like they don't have very many spots on their tail, sometimes hardly any. So that's one way. Trout has a lot of spots. 
Oh, this is Onkarinka's Gorbushta. That would be pink salmon. And these are spawners. You got the male and the female. And you're most often going to see these from above. And the way to, quickest way to tell pinks when you're looking at a spawning ground from the stream bank and you're not that close, they look almost two tone, don't they? Black above and lighter below when, when looked at from above. Of course, the male has this huge hump that he gets in fresh water for chasing the other uh, guys away from his girlfriend. The big nose, the hooked jaw, the teeth. Same thing. He won't have these teeth in the ocean. Pinks tend to be more like a plankton feeder when they're out in the ocean. Lots of spots on the tail, whether they're silver bright in the ocean without the hump, or in this case on the spawning ground here. And this is about as big as they go. They have pretty much a set two-year life cycle. You'll see adult pinks in the lower half of the province, down from a place called Cape Caution on the island. Every odd year, in the northern half of the province, they're even years. There are a few streams that get them both. There's the female here. Looks like she hadn't spawned yet. She'll give birth to a bunch of ceramic fry, I'm sure. A few teeth, not very many. And the same thing, the sm relatively small size. Uh, very, very small scales. When you see a pink in the open ocean and they're silver bright, look for those tiny little scales. And again, these really big spots on the tail and that relatively small size. You might, in the ocean, confuse an adult pink with a sort of a juvenile Chinook but the Chinook will have smaller spots on the tail, the tail's a little more square, and the Chinook's got a black mouth, pink does not. Well, if we go to Adams River, Sockeye. It's the male, of course. He was silver bright in the ocean. He didn't have this hump, he didn't have the hook, he didn't have the teeth. Now, a silver Sockeye in the ocean, one of the things that can be really tough, especially, say, at night on the deck of a boat under the lights, is could be confused with a coho or a chum, and coho have teeth in the mouth when they're in the marine phase, being the predator that they are. So if you carefully put your hand in the mouth and feel around, you'll feel those needle sharp teeth. That's true with the Chinook too. The chum or the uh, sockeye doesn't have that, neither does the chum. The sockeye in the ocean has silver, or it's the only one that does not have silver in the tail. That's the number one way to tell a silver bright sockeye from anybody else. The only adult salmon with no tail silver at all. The chum has silver, the rest of them do too. Of course, the chum, that's another dead giveaway. See this anal fin here? There's no white spot right where my finger is. All chum have that. Look for that white spot on the anal fin. That's a sure way to tell a chum, whether it's silver bright, whether it's spawning, whatever the case may be. And on the spawning rounds, sometimes there might be a chance to confuse a coho with a sockeye, because people see some coho, which also tend to turn quite red, especially the males, and they think, oh, sockeye salmon. The spawning coho will always have those white gums. The sockeye doesn't have that. The coho's head doesn't get this shade of green the way a sockeye does. And the coho red, I know it's a little subjective, their red coloration tends to get a little deeper red, almost crimson, than sockeye do too. And keeping in mind as well that the appearance of some of these fish vary from stream to stream. Pitt River sockeye don't get very red at all. And they're kind of a thing of all their own. So it really depends where you are. All right, so here we are in the month of May and we've got a bunch of adult salmon here, which you're really not gonna see in May. We brought these in, we staged it. But having said that, I do wanna talk a little bit about the timing and the habits of some of these species of salmon we're talking about here. You could have a stream that would have chum spawning in October and it could dry up in the summer. As long as those rains come back for the fall, the salmon will come in, use that as spawning habitat, the fry will leave from March to May, and then they have very little dependence on fresh water. A chum in fresh water, it's, well, I wouldn't say it's a piece of cake, but it's getting there. Here we have a male, and have a look at the uh, mouth on this guy. It is a guy, that's for intimidating other males, and for attracting females. Those big teeth, that long nose, and the bigger that nose, the longer the jaw, the more choices he's gonna have with females. A big dominant male like this one might spawn with three or four different females. The female's also gonna have a change in color, and on both of these, you can see the purple bars along the side. 
In the ocean, this fish would look like something you'd see in the grocery store, all bright silver. But I think I'd mentioned about a, a dead giveaway to distinguish chum from the most likely confusing fish when they're silver bright would be a sockeye. You'd see this white spot here? Right on the anal fin, right where my finger is. Chum always have that, sockeye never do. Another thing, not here in freshwater, but in the ocean, the chum has silver in the tail, sockeye does not. And those are two ways to tell when they're silver bright. So the girl has a smaller nose, some teeth, not as much as the male. This is her shovel for making the nest to the red. She'll have probably three or four of them. Don't put her eggs in one basket, as it were. And maybe a thousand in one red, a thousand in another one until she's done. Over a period of about seven to 10 days, the spawning season. Another seven to 10 days, she'll get weaker and weaker, try to defend her nest, drift down river, and her life goes back to the creek. And they do not have white tails. These chum came out of a freezer, so that's what's happened to them. So again, the big teeth, the long nose, and the bars all over the side, that's your chum salmon. Yeah, their scientific name is Soncarinchus keta, which means the dog salmon, of course. We're walking up river, and we have a couple Chinook, also known as the spring salmon, because they're the earliest timed run to come into the Fraser. These are long distance travelers in fresh water. They can go as far as streams around Prince George, Bowen River, really long distance. The Chinook is the largest species of Pacific salmon. This one I'm holding now is about typical adult size. There is a record of about 50 kilograms, one that was caught near Rivers Inlet. That fish was, pardon my uh, English units, four feet, 10 inches long and probably about eight years old. So chum, usually three to five years at adulthood. Chinook can be three to even seven or eight. The Chinook have a very black mouth. I don't know if you can see that. And that's through their whole adult life in the ocean as well as back when they come to spawn. Almost looks like someone took a paintbrush in there. The spotting on the back is another clue. It can resemble a pink, but the pink, it's telling spots from blotches. The pinks have big blotches. The Chinook, more like spots. And a very, very well spotted tail. Again, this one's in spawning condition. If he were a little fresher, a little silverier, it would really be easy to see. So spots just all over this tail. There we go. Also a Chinook. The black mouth, the spots, that Chinook tail. Was, why is he so small? This is a male and these come back a year before the big guys do. For whatever reason, maybe he fed well in the ocean. He thought, you know what? I'm big enough now, I'm gonna come back and spawn with the big guys. And they can and will do that. These are called precocious fish and probably 95% of them do it as males. There are females that do it too. We call those gels, but they're a lot more rare than the male jacks are. So a Chinook Jack. So if you see this and you don't know if it's a pink, because you can confuse those, look for, again, blotches, not spots. This doesn't have that two-tone coloration that the pink does. And the pink male, of course, is gonna have that hump. A Chinook Jack isn't really gonna get that although they do get a little bit of a hump, especially in the males. Female Chinook will not have the same kind of hook as the male does. Uh, otherwise, pretty much everything's the same. This uh, male Chinook isn't really red, but they are capable of getting pretty red on the spawning grounds. So uh, if you have red on your salmon, don't think automatically sockeye. It could be a Chinook, it could be a coho. But there's a Chinook. Oh, speaking of red, here we go. Coho salmon. Also, I call them the Christmas fish because they get this Christmas coloration. And they're one of the latest time spawners. Whereas your Chinook can spawn anywhere from the summertime for an interior stock of fish, all the way through to about November or so for Harrison fish near the coast. These coho can do it any time from June, July, all the way through to as late as February or March of the following year for stocks that are really close to the coast. There's uh, the only rule about spawning timing is that there are no rules. Every stock is hardwired a little bit differently. In general, you're gonna see spawning on the coast in the fall, but that's in general. A lot of exceptions. I'm gonna take you down to Seattle, Washington, 
where Lake Washington sockeye, what they've evolved to do, they come in through Ballard Locks in June in silver right condition and they hold in Lake Washington all summer. There's even at times been a bit of a sport fishery for silver bright sockeye that are in this kind of condition and they don't go up into the Duwamish or the Green River until October or November to spawn. In the Seymour in North Vancouver it's the same thing. There's a summer run of coho that come in in June, July and oftentimes they don't spawn until October. So the coho salmon depends a lot on fresh water more than any other salmonid species. Chinooks usually stick around three months before they're off to the ocean, but coho, over half their lives are in fresh water. A lot of people don't realize that. When these fry from these hatch out, there's a few of them here today, they'll be in this area, they'll find a small little feeder stream, oftentimes only this wide, and they'll migrate as far up that stream at the fry stage as they possibly can. And that's a built-in survival instinct. The farther upstream you go, the less likely you get blown out in a flood. And they'll be in there until they're about 15 to 16 months old and leave for the ocean at the uh, smolt stage, as long as my finger is known as fingerlings. So it's a year and a half in fresh water, a year and a half in the ocean, that, that's it. So the three-year-old fish or four. Here is a silver bright coho. And now I mentioned, I think earlier, about the ID book says, these fish have spots on only the upper lobe of the tail fin. <clears throat> Well, this one, gee whiz, he's got spots on the upper and the lower. So don't get married to absolutes like that. But you can sure see the difference between the coho tail and a chinook tail. So it's not where the spots are, it's the number of them. So it's a coho because it's got a coho tail. Very, very few spots, and that's what I would go with. For a silver bright coho, such as this one, it, especially at night on a boat or something like that under the lights, this might be confused with a sockeye. And a way to tell is to very carefully put your finger in here and feel around. You're gonna feel some needle sharp teeth in there because the coho is a predator. It's the most predatory of all salmon. Even coho this big have been known to prey on smaller fish. It's a good thing they don't get to be four meters longer. My job would be even more interesting than it already is. The sockeye won't have these teeth in there. You'll feel nothing because they're mainly a plankton feeder. Talk back about the chum with the uh, hook nose. Coho males really get that. Sometimes the females do it to some extent too. So don't use that as an absolute gospel when you're comparing a male to the female. Because the females do develop something, something of a hook. And sometimes they get red color, but just not as much as the males do. A real giveaway with coho, and if you're down looking at your stream, looking over the bank, even from a distance, what will stand out, look at those white gums. They, especially on spawning fish, those really do stand out. So that's a good way to tell a coho from anything else. Okay, so most of the time, for at least our part of the world, you know, unless you go out on a commercial fish boat or something like that, you're going to run into these critters on the spawning grounds, looking at like this. So especially if you're new to the game here, a couple things is bring your little ID chart, bring your cheat sheet with you. So if you have a sticker, is that a coho, is that a chum, is that a pink or a chinook jack? You've got this as a kind of a fallback, just as a little bit of a help, okay? And again, expect the unexpected. It's not unusual to find a stray. We were talking a few minutes ago about salmon will tend to stray. They are colonizers, that's kind of what they do. So a chum salmon, for example, it, might come back to the same spot it was born in, but it's more than likely going to come back to the same area. They've imprinted on the smell of this water as they left for the Fraser. They do mess up. I once found, uh, here we have a hatchery origin coal. The reason I know that is there's no adipose fin. This fin right above where my finger is, it should be there, it's not. That was clipped off when the fish was small. And in this case, it had a tag in its nose that was put in at the hatchery by a machine. And I found this fish at McKay Creek in North Vancouver. Same lab, and they phoned me back two days later and said, where'd you find this thing? And I'm thinking it's a Capilano fish. It was from the Duwamish in Washington State. So, oops. <laughs> so you just never know. Let's go to some great links to talk about links. Different kind of links you're going to hear about. For a juvenile fish, you're going to be talking about fork length. And no supper table here. Your fork length is simply from the tip of the nose to the fork, that's the deepest part of the tail. 
So nose to fork if you want to call it, that's correct too. But on a spawning fish, not going to do that for two reasons. One is the nose changes in terms of length and shape. And maybe that tail's worn away from digging the red, the nest spawning. So we're going to go from the orbital, the back of the eye right here, to the hyperal. What's the hyperal? Well, it's this base of the tail. There's a, what we call a hyperal plate. You can bend the tail. There's a little crease right where my finger is there. And that's never going to change. So you want to measure from the back of the eye to the hyperal plate. We call that post-orbital hyperal. So fork length for juveniles, post-orbital hyperal for your spawners. Okay, at some time you might have occasion to open up one of these fish. During a spawning survey, you want to look for things like, is there any disease? What's the spawning success? Or on a fish that's this bright, and believe me, you can encounter a coho this bright right here being the immature fish they are when they come in. They sometimes don't fully mature for three months after they're in fresh water. So you might not even know for sure if this is a male or female. So we're going to start off with making sure whatever you're using, and I really like these egg knives, you get them through a place called Dynamic Aqua Supply, you can Google it. Make sure they're good and sharp, whatever you're using. And make sure you have a good grip on the fish. If there's slime, you want to get that off of there. I like to start up at the head, like this, and take your knife in where the vent is. It's right in front of the anal fin. It's a good starting place. And a good grip. And we're going to go around these two pelvic fins. There's a big bone between them. If you hit that, you're going to be you're some golly gee whizzes going on. So around the pelvic we go. Get our fingers out of the way. And there we go. We got a girl. There's some eggs there. This is uh, the swim bladder, this little bag of air here. And that allows her to hover in the water. Also, I'm on is a lot of fish have this swim bladder. Sharks and sturgeons, they do not. So as soon as they stop, it's like... <whistles> and all kinds of other things in here, like your liver, intestines, there's a spleen there. The heart's up in here somewhere, and I'm having too much fun with this. So again, just uh, work very carefully. The last thing you want to do is cut yourself when your hands are this slimed up like this. So good sharp knives, good solid grip on the fish, and a good surface to work on. And uh, just, uh, this might be overstating the obvious, but you're only going to be opening up a dead fish, not a live one. I should mention, I'm just going to throw this in. This is something not many people get to do. It's really cool. Uh, trout can repeat spawn. Cutthroats, steelheads, can spawn more than once. And they're spring spawners. They'll spawn and then often go back out to the ocean. Or in the case of a resident cutthroat trout that never leaves, it'll spawn and just, you know, recover for a month or so and go right back to being a trout again. So at a hatchery, how are you going to spawn one of those? Well, they take a needle, an air pump, put an incision through the fish and pump it up full of air and force the eggs out and spawn the fish alive. It's called air spawning. And then your female gets the worst case of gas since the last Pepto-Bismol commercial. But it works and it enables you to spawn the fish without killing them. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Tebow and I'm a community advisor with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Salmon Enhancement Program. I work in the Lower Fraser South and the Eastern Fraser Valley. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about fish ID and to go over some of the tools that you have at your disposal. So whenever you're out in the field looking to identify a fish, whether it's a juvenile or an adult, there's dozens of different resources available that can help you to identify the fish that you're looking at. So one of my favorites is the field identification of coastal juvenile salmonids. It has some really great pictures, color pictures in there that show all the different species of uh, salmonids that you might find in coastal BC. And it also goes through some really important identifying characteristics of juvenile salmonids. So when you're looking at the anatomy of a fish, there's a few pieces that you need to know what they are in order to identify it properly. So we'll start at the front. Right here, this little rigid piece of cartilage that runs along the top of the fish's mouth is called the maxillary. And that's an important identifying feature to be able to tell the difference between different species of salmonids. Um, another one we wanna look at, you wanna be able to look at the pectoral fins, which are the two fins at the front of the fish, as well as the pelvic fins, which are the two fins near the uh, vent. Another important one is the anal fin, which is located by, uh, posterior to the pelvic fins. 
you have your caudal fin and the caudal peduncle is the narrowest piece of flesh right before you get into the fin itself. Uh, adipose fin up on top and the dorsal fin on the back. You also have the lateral line, which is usually a fairly distinct line running right down the middle of the fish. So when you go out trapping for juvenile salmonids, you can be doing this at any time of year. It's always good to uh, think first about what kind of species you might expect to see there. So if you're trapping in a creek in the coastal area of BC in the fall, you're probably not going to expect to see a pink or a chum salmon because they would have already migrated out to sea. Your uh, most likely candidate would probably be either coho, cutthroat, steelhead, or resident rainbow trout. So once you have it narrowed down, to what your sort of usual suspects might be and what you should be expecting to find in your traps, you can turn to one of these handy guides and start looking at some of the features that you see on the fish in your traps. So you can see on this page here, there's a really handy dichotomous key and it starts asking you basically yes or no questions. So the first one is, are par marks present? If par marks are absent, you can be pretty assured that that's a pink. If they're present, then you can go over to the next line and that will ask you another question that further helps you to identify the species. This goes on and on down the line, and this should be able to help you identify our five Pacific salmon species. Once you've got a pretty good idea of what kind of fish that you're looking at, you can go into the page in the book that shows some more detail about that species and start going through the list and checking off some of those uh, distinguishing characteristics. Now, not every fish you see is going to have all of those distinguishing characteristics just because there's a lot of variation in nature and not every coho looks alike. Uh, but this is a really good place to go through and sort of confirm your uh, identification. This field identification guide for juvenile salmonids is another really good resource to take out in the field with you. It's got a uh, number of line drawings in it and that shows some of the more uh, particular measurements like the length of the anal fin or the number of rays in the anal fin, uh, the length of the maxillary relative to the eye, number of par marks and the shape of the par marks. So it's always really important if you are going to do some trapping in your creek to make sure that you have both your pro uh, provincial and federal scientific collection permits in hand. Uh, you wanna make sure you're in regulatory compliance. It's not just anyone who can go out and catch fish out of a creek. And uh, you wanna make sure you're not breaking any laws when you're doing that. So when you're working through the dichotomous key or identification chart, there will basically be a series of yes or no questions that you can answer to help you identify your catch. The first one being, are par marks present or absent? If par marks are absent, well, then you have a pretty good idea that you're looking at a pink. If par marks are present, it will go on to ask you more questions about the details about those par marks. So if they're oval shaped and less length than the vertical diameter of the eye, you'll have a pretty good idea that you're looking at a sockeye or a chum. And there's another key for, or another question further down the line that will ask you a more in-depth question about some of their features to be able to distinguish between those two species. So if the fish you're looking at has par marks that are longer than the vertical diameter of the eye, you've got a pretty good idea that you're looking at a coho or chinook. Moving on down the column, it'll ask you questions about the adipose of each of these species. If your adipose fin is uniformly pigmented, your anal fin is sickle shaped, the anal and dorsal fins have white leading edge followed by a black stripe, you're probably looking at a coho. If the adipose fin has an unpigmented window, the anal fin is not sickle shaped, the dorsal fin has a dark leading edge and a white tip, you're probably looking at a Chinook. So if you've got a pretty good idea of what kind of fish you're looking at, you can flip a few more pages back in the ID book and there'll be some really specific features that you wanna look for. These will include things like the length of the fish because uh, certain species grow to bigger sizes than others in fresh water. Um, and then things, really good details about some of the fins and some of the other features that you might find on the fish. So for example, with a co coho, the anal fin might be sickle shaped and the leading edge would be longer than the base. The leading edge of the anal and dorsal fins would be white followed by black. The adipose fin would have dark edge and a, uh, the center of it would be opaque. The caudal, anal, and adipose fins should be pale orange. And that's one of the really most distinguishing features about a coho is that bright orange color. If you were looking at a Chinook, which might be in the trap at the same time as a coho and look quite similar, the anal fin would not be sickle shaped. The leading edge of the anal fin would be shorter than its base. The leading edge of the anal fin would be white. The adipose fin has a clear center or window through it. And the dorsal fin has dark leading edges and a white tip. 
So sometimes it can be really tough to identify what species you might be looking at, especially if you have a steelhead smolt and a cutthroat, for example. Uh, so it's something you can do in that situation is just make your best guess and make a note in the comment section that it is a guess and that you're not 100% certain about what kind of fish you're looking at. So it's really important to remember that trapping can be a really stressful event on fish. And that's why it's really important to record your data as quickly as possible and to release the fish as soon as you can back to the location where you trapped it from. This will minimize any stress and the fish will go back to living his happy little fish life as soon as he can. So if you want to learn more about how to identify fish, there's actually a module available through the Stream Keepers. Uh, you can take Stream Keepers Module 11 training and that will go through how to capture and identify fish and find out who's living in your creek. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can visit pskf.ca. So when you're looking at adult salmon in the field, they tend to be a little bit easier to identify because of their striking bright spawning colors. So one of the keys that I like to take out with me is this one here. Uh, this is actually provided by DFO. It usually comes in a one page format, but this one's been stapled to a piece of uh, chloroplast so that it's a little bit more durable and a little bit more rigid. Uh, you can see you have the ocean phase colors of all the fish on here as well as the spawning phase. Most of you are probably gonna see the fish when they're in their spawning phases like these ones here. And it makes it really easy to go look in your creek, see what kind of fish you're looking at and figure out who you've got. So if you're looking at an adult pink salmon in its spawning colors, you might notice that it has dark elongated spots on its back, dark spots on both lobes of its tail, very small scales relative to the other fish, and light colored gums. If you're looking at an adult sockeye salmon that's come back to spawn, you might notice it has some fine speckles on its back, no dark trim on the rear of its dorsal fin, a very thick caudal peduncle, fine speckles on the tail, and it will usually have the bright red color and green head and tail that we come to associate with sockeye. So adult chum salmon are probably one of the most distinctive salmon when they come back to spawn. They've got those beautiful green and purple bars all the way across their body. You might also notice some fine speckles on the back, similar to a sockeye, but a chum will have a much more narrow caudal peduncle. When you're looking at an adult coho salmon, it usually has dark spots on its back, but only spots on the upper half of its tail. It will also have white gums. The coho might look a little bit similar to a spawning Chinook salmon, but a Chinook will have spots on both lobes of its tail, as well as dark spots all across its back, and the Chinook has black gums as well as black teeth. So when you're looking at a spawning Chinook, it might look a little bit similar to a spawning coho, as they both have dark spots all across their back. However, a Chinook will have spots on both lobes of its tail, and it'll have a really distinctive black gum line. Hello, my name is Matt Townsend. I'm a biologist with uh, DFO, Salmon Stock Assessment Division in the Fraser and Interior area. Today, I'll be talking about stock assessment, how it's conducted and what it's used for. I'll start off with an outline about my talk. What I'll start with is just a description of how DFO is structured. And then uh, from there, I'll go on to who uses stock assessment information, particularly what groups within DFO uh, our clients for stock assessment data. From there, I'll go on to key types of salmon and stock assessment, and then important considerations when you're conducting stock assessments. And finally, how stock assessments conducted by community organizations are important. So here we have a very simple diagram of DFO and a couple of key sections within DFO. Uh, the first one I have at the top there is resource management. Resource management is the group that's responsible for turning off and turning on fisheries. They say who can fish where and when. So this ranges from everything from recreational fisheries to food, social, ceremonial fisheries, economic opportunity fisheries, and commercial fisheries as well. Next up is the Fish and Fish Habitat Protection Program. Uh, this is the group that's uh, responsible for uh, investigating uh, individuals or entities that encroach or destroy uh, fish habitat. And uh, they would also be issuing permits for uh, in-stream works or anything that might uh, affect fish habitat. And then uh, third down the list here, we have the Salon Enhancement Program, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, this includes hatcheries, not just the big DFO hatcheries like uh, Chilliwack, Jehalis, Inch, Tenderfoot, but also the community hatcheries. Uh, which are often funded with SEP 
funds and are coordinated with the help of community advisors who work for SEP. And then within SEP as well as a resource restoration unit, which again, many of you may be familiar with. And these are the people who are doing habitat enhancement and improvements. And then uh, the last year I have the science division and within, uh, sorry, science section within that is stock assessment division, which is my home. Uh, just uh, should mention stock assessment is done on all kinds of species, uh, both marine and freshwater, invertebrates and vertebrates. So there's uh, prawn stock assessments and gooey duck clam stock assessments and uh, halibut stock assessments, rockfish stock assessments. So we're obviously here today talking about salmon stock assessments. Uh, that's what I'm familiar with. So stock assessment uh, data is fed back into and used by these groups. Uh, resource management obviously needs to know how many fish are returning. It helps them decide whether they're going to open a fishery and when. Uh, fish habitat protection uh, is important for them to know when they're issuing permits, if it's uh, important habitat for spawning. And uh, so on enhancement program, we can help inform uh, hatchery production, uh, habitat enhancement, and that, that sort of thing. And also stock assessment information is very valuable. It feeds back into science itself. Uh, we have a long-term data set, which is useful for addressing questions um, with regards to say, uh, changing ocean uh, regime, changes in productivity, that sort of thing. Next, I'll review some of the key methods we use for stock assessment. Okay, first up, we have fish fences. Shown is a fish fence on the Birkenhead River used for counting sockeye salmon. This one in particular uh, covers the entire river with only a small opening to let fish through only one or two at a time. Fish are counted as they pass through. This results in a total census of the population. Uh, we can do a partial fence in conjunction with a uh, hydroacoustic uh, device as well that we can see the fish moving through. That basically serves the same function, gives us a very precise, almost a sense of fish moving through. So this, um, these fences can also be used for other things like brood collection, like are used in Kanaka and Little Campbell. But uh, as anyone who's familiar with these know, they're very capital intensive require a lot of work and a lot of upkeep uh, to keep them uh, functioning during the migration and spawning. So uh, very intensive to use a fish. These are only used for uh, uh, large populations that we want a very, very high precision estimate for. Next, we have marker capture studies, which usually uh, consist of uh, tagging and then uh, recovering dead fish to see the proportion of fish that are tagged. Now, this is, uh, also a method that gives us a high precision estimate with some uh, error around it, but it's usually a known error so that we can calculate our confidence around our estimate. Uh, but again, this isn't as equipment intensive, but it is labor intensive. It usually needs a crew of six to eight people at least, and for you know two and a half or three months during the course of the run to get a uh, uh, accurate assessment of the stock. So again, a uh, fairly expensive proposition. Third method we use are visual creek walks or visual surveys. Uh, just walk on the stream at regular intervals, uh, usually weekly, and counting live fish, and uh, often counting dead fish or carcasses as well. And this, uh, if done regularly uh, throughout the spawning season, can still give us a fairly good estimate of uh, the population or the stock in that stream, and uh, can at the very least give us an idea <coughs> of the direction the, the population setting uh, whether it's stable or increasing or decreasing. And uh, this is fairly inexpensive, just needs a couple people to visit a creek once a week. And this is a method I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about in the next several slides. So we'll focus on uh, stream surveys, uh, spawner counts, line counts, dead counts, the kind of uh, stream surveys that, and stock system that most of us are familiar with and which includes just regular weekly visits and counting of live and, and sometimes dead fish. I do wanna say before I go through this, that this is uh, covered very well in the Stream Keepers uh, 
manual, uh, the session module 12. Uh, Zoan did an excellent job of putting this together. I'm just going to kind of review this and uh, confirm that it is what DFO does as well and highlight some things that we think are especially important. Uh, one thing I like to think of when I think about these surveys, I think about the important or the, the really base information we want is the who, what, where, and when. So who, just the names of the surveyors and uh, you know possibly the, the stream keeper group as well, is that as long as that's recorded for every survey. The what, what species are you counting that survey? Uh, make sure you specify when you're recording your counts, are you recording live fish or dead fish? And uh, be specific about that. Um, you might be recording for dead fish, you might be looking at the adipose fin clip, so that's something else you'd be recording. Environmental conditions are also an important component of uh, those survey data sheets uh, that help us understand uh, possible trends in, in what you're seeing. If, if you're not seeing very many fish, it could be because environmental conditions weren't good. So it's important to record those as well. Where? This is also very important. Uh, of course, the stream name, we want to know what stream you're surveying, but also the start point and end point. We want to know the extent of the survey, uh, where the survey began and where it ends. It's so uh, the physical description is good. Even better is a GPS coordinate because uh, someone down the line who's looking at your data sheet might not know uh, the landmarks that you're referring to. So GPS coordinates are great if you can get those down. And of course, the when. This is very important, but if there's no date recorded, then it's hard to use that info in, um, in, or put it in context with other surveys. So I know this stuff seems fairly straightforward, but it is very, very important. And uh, without these things recorded, then the survey becomes much less useful uh, to people who are, uh, who are gathering the data and, and um, looking to analyze it. Some other considerations when we're conducting stream surveys. Um, we always like to say we want to start and end our annual surveys on a zero. So that means we do our first survey before fish have arrived and we do our final survey after all fish have uh, spawned and died. And then within that, we'll have regular surveys, you know, probably weekly uh, throughout the spawning season. So if you can have regular, spawn, regular surveys uh, throughout the spawning season and then bracketed by a zero on either end, that really means you've captured the entire spawning run and you can be confident in, uh, in your escapement or your spawning es population estimate you're going to produce. And we, for this method, we use something called AUC area under the curve. There's a great video by Chuck Parkin on the PSKF uh, data, save, data um, sorry, website, I believe by Chuck Parkins that describes how that's uh, done. But uh, having uh, first and last survey uh, these zeros along with regular surveys throughout the spawning season means you can be really confident in your AUC estimate um, and feel good about the work you did that year. That said, uh, we do live on the you know Pacific coast. Weather is an issue. We get blowouts, we get bad weather. Um, and so we recognize that we can't always get in regular surveys throughout the spawning season. And compiled with the fact that there's logistics with getting people to the stream, especially with volunteers, we know that weekly surveys might not happen. Please don't give up. Please keep surveying. Um, but just as an ideal, ideal we work towards uh, what I've put in the first three bullets here. Um, besides those regular surveys, we're all obviously going to stay safe. Um, we always say we don't send crews out unless we know they can get back safely. So nothing's uh, worth more than your safety. So. Uh, we're going to wear proper PPE. That means uh, slip resistant shoes, uh, probably waders, bear spray if necessary, all those types of things. Uh, stay safe when you're out there doing your stream service. And again, follow PSKF module 12. That's going to have all the, all the basics you need to conduct a stream survey that's going to be really useful for us uh, and for you. And then when you're finished, enter the data in the PSKF database. And I'll go over why that's important in the next slide. So how is the stock assessment information collected by community groups useful to DFO? Well, for the lower Fraser watershed, uh, DFO is developing techniques to estimate total chum and coho return uh, to the lower Fraser. So this is just a lump sum. Uh, it's using test fisheries 
uh, in conjunction with some genetic stock ID um, and some specific population estimates to kind of do an expansion and get uh, get whole system estimate, estimates or just a lump sum estimate for all the chum returning to the lower Fraser, all the coho returning to the lower Fraser. We just uh, so that gives us um, that, but we just don't have the resources to monitor all local chum and coho populations uh, in the Fraser, Boundary Bay, right in that house sound. Uh, we just don't have the resources to, to be on all those systems and all those all those streams. So this is where community groups can be really useful. They can provide local context for population trends. Uh, you know, this kind of stock assessment information gives us effects of habit hatchery enhancement. You know, we can look for a response of um, in-stream populations to increase or, or changes in hatchery input. Um, we can look at the effects of habitat enhancement. Uh, so, for instance, maybe there's a migration barrier downstream that the habitat group or RRU has worked to remove, and uh, stock assessment uh, stream surveys are going to show us if fish are able to uh, now navigate the area where there was a migration area before. Uh, also, can show response to uh, work done to improve spawning habitat, you know, uh, spawning channels or off-channel juvenile habitat, all those kind of things uh, we can see a signal from in our stock assessment. Uh, and then also give us some more info on just broader population trends that relate to survival, both freshwater marine survival, uh, ocean productivity. And uh, so, you know, these kind of uh, local scale uh, assessments can give us some important context uh, to fill in around our larger lump sum estimates for the lower Fraser Coho and lower Fraser Chum. Um, and DFO is working with uh, PSKF and Zoan, as I should say, Tracy Cohen at DFO is working with Zoan and PSKF. Uh, Trying to make it so the database from PSKF can be integrated with our own database, which will make, uh, you know, stock assessment input uh, collected by community groups, just much more easy to access by those user groups I showed uh, earlier on in my presentation. Uh, things like resource management, um, fish habitat, and so forth. So, um, you know, that data is, is available to us now, but it's just not easily available. It's kind of clunky. So integrating these two databases will make it uh, that much more easy for uh, DFO, those in DFO to access uh, StreamKeeper data. So how can stock assessment information collected by community groups be useful to these community groups? Well, starting off for the same reasons I just uh, listed at the end of the last slide about why it's useful to DFO, it can also be useful to uh, community groups. You can see the effects of local hatchery enhancement, effects of uh, local habitat enhancement, and just kind of monitor the, the population trends of your local stream or watershed. Uh, these stock assessments, these kind of regular counts and uh, and population or spawning stock assessments will kind of really give you an idea of how fish are responding to activities within the watershed. Um, you know, almost a, a, a another big benefit that I'm sure you all are aware of, and I know from my time uh, working with uh, or volunteering with community groups, is um, stream surveys just get people out in the watershed. And this is true for DFO as well. Um, there's no report. There's no. There's no replacement for boots on the ground. And so people who are out uh, walking the streams, uh, looking at fish are gonna be able to quickly identify migration barriers, barriers or other habitat related issues. They'll be able to see spawning success, you know, looking at fish carcasses, telling if fish are able to uh, spawn successfully, if there might be something affecting um, spawning success. You can observe things, uh, poaching or other activities that you might be concerned about. And um, just by getting out there in the watershed, uh, you know, you're working with each other and working with your community to learn more about the watershed. And that's really, um, really something to be said for that. Um, sure, I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, I feel it needs to be put out there that this is an intangible, but it, it is something that is very, very important. Seems like I really ran over time, so I'm going to wrap it up quickly. I just want to say thank you to Scott Ducharme from DFO, Trace Cohen from DFO for kind of organizing this, and Zoan Morton for organizing this. Uh, I want to just quickly thank Sandy Hall Kenyon, who was one of my first contacts at DFO, who gave me a job way back in the day, and uh, Port Moody Ecological Society when I first moved here in 2001. Uh, took me under their wing and, and uh, 
these guys taught me a lot about uh, what I know today. So especially Mr. Dave Benny uh, and some of the other folks there. Uh, I just wanted to thanks to everyone and thanks for listening. Thank you to the speakers and the facilitators. I know your presentations will have inspired some great questions and conversation. The link to the live question and answer is in the description below, below on your screen, and was also emailed to you on your agenda. Thank you all for attending SEP Community Workshop 2021, and we look forward to the watershed tours set for tomorrow afternoon. Thank you so much again to the planning team for your dedication and hard work. We couldn't have had this wonderful digital experience without you all. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday and we will see you all tomorrow for the Sunday afternoon tours. Thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you at the next set workshop in two years from now in person. Can't wait. <laughs>